This 2023 ASCO Annual Meeting Plenary Video Interview is supported in part by Folsom Pharma USA. It is an honor to be at ASCO to be part of the community that has radically advanced care for the patients who inspire us daily. Folsom is a patient-centered, global, innovative pharmaceutical company. We're committed to delivering world-class science to advance the care of cancer patients around the world. So the key takeaway is that patients with locally advanced rectal cancer have options. And those options include achieving a very high cure rate, either with the standard approach that has prevailed as the way we've treated this condition for over 30 years, predominantly in North America, with five and a half weeks of chemotherapy and radiation combined, followed by surgery. And then depending on the surgical findings with some post-operative chemotherapy. Or what the study found is that we have an alternative to that strategy that achieves a comparable level of cure. And that is the chemotherapy alone approach. So that involves use of a common chemotherapy regimen, Folfox, administered for six cycles, followed by re-evaluation with an MRI scan of the pelvis. And if that scan demonstrates that the rectal cancer has responded well, patients can go directly to the operating room without having pelvic radiation. For the unfortunate group whose cancers don't respond well to the chemotherapy, they get, if you will, a second shot to have the radiation. Um, and we showed in the prospect trial that these two strategies achieve nearly identical outcomes. And we have long-term outcomes, so at five years, the overall survival rates are similar. The study's primary endpoint was disease-free survival. And uh, the study showed that the chemotherapy only approach was non-inferior to the standard approach. So the take home is patients have options and there's more than one way to achieve a very high cure rate. The clinical implications are it's important for certain subgroups of patients. So for example, we know that there is an increasingly high rate of colorectal cancer diagnosed in individuals who are young, under the age of 50. Now it's important to note that this is still the minority of individuals diagnosed with colorectal cancer, but the rates for reasons we don't understand very well are rising in this age group. So take, for example, women who have not yet completed childbearing. If you undergo pelvic radiation, the uterus is no longer able to sustain a pregnancy. So if you're a woman and you have a diagnosis of rectal cancer and you still would like to have children, now you have an option and you can preserve the ability to uh, be pregnant and carry a child to term along with achieving a maximal cure rate. Um, so that is just an example of a subgroup of patients for whom it's uh, very important. So there are people who live in rural parts of the United States. I think globally around the world, there are many countries in which there is simply not access to radiation. And we show that it is possible to achieve comparable cure rates for the 
subgroup, and again, the study did not pertain to all locally advanced rectal cancer patients. That's a critically important point. But for the group that we included in the clinical trial, so a very a, a moderate risk group, for that moderate risk group, we can achieve the cure with chemotherapy, a, a chemotherapy first approach. It's also important to note that around 10% of individuals who we tried the chemotherapy first approach ended up needing radiation as well. But again, it was a, a, a package, package deal, including the chemotherapy first and then only giving the radiation if individuals responded poorly to the chemo. But in the many parts of the world where it's a very long drive to the nearest radiation facility or where radiation facilities simply aren't available, we've opened up an alternative strategy. The chemotherapy regimen is six cycles given every two weeks. But for many patients, that's going to be a lot more convenient than 28 days, Monday to Friday, usually. 28 sessions of daily radiation. In the acute setting, individuals who receive 5-FU and pelvic radiation therapy tend to have impaired bowel function. So diarrhea, cramping, some abdominal discomfort, but this is for the most part transient. Um, there's a small subgroup who have very severe diarrhea and end up needing hydration. And uh, in some cases, it's severe enough to require an overnight uh, stay in the hospital. But for the most part, this is quite well managed. Um, again, because we've been giving pelvic radiation with 5-FU for over 30 years, Nearly all oncologists around the world are very familiar at uh, handling and managing these side effects. The issue with radiation is much more the long-term side effects, and those are variable. Those can include long-term impaired bowel function, long-term impaired bladder function, issues like uh, incontinence, and in particular, an issue that is not very often discussed and quite hard to measure because people often don't discuss it, impaired uh, sexual function. And that can affect both men and women. Um, another potential concern of pelvic chemoradiation in the long term is that if because you're radiating the pelvis where um, many of the blood cells are made, the the bone marrow there is an important source of, of how we make um, red cells and white cells that individuals um, may tolerate chemotherapy in the future less well if they've received radiation to those pelvic bones. Um, and and long-term follow-up and ongoing studies are going to be necessary for us to see um, whether that bears out. The toxicity in the chemotherapy group principally is neuropathy, which is a sensory disorder of small nerve endings that particularly affects hands and feet. So for example, if an individual is a, I don't know, crochet maven or a concert violinist, the chemotherapy alone approach probably would not be best. That person would probably be better served with uh, the radiation. Now, if we have a concert violinist who wishes to carry a pregnancy and they have to make a choice, that's gonna be a tough one. But again, having options empowers us to help our patients make custom tailored choices to their own preferences. I think that we collected a wealth of data in this trial. And one of the things that I am the most proud of that we did in this trial is we asked the patients themselves. 
So we had patients tell us every single week um, by telephone or by computer to tell us exactly how they're feeling. And so we are delighted to be able to report toxicities, not as reported by physicians, but as reported by patients. And we can use um, diagrams that describe and show that data that patients can understand quickly and easily, and then pick the strategy that resonates most with them. For some patients, it's the schedule, the chemotherapy alone approach, we say six visits for chemotherapy every two weeks, if everything goes smoothly, 90% chance that that works and you won't need radiation, 10% will have to go back and do the radiation and here are the toxicities versus 28 days of daily visits for radiation but that's done in a shorter period of time, only five and a half weeks, and then you're off to surgery. So, and, and here are the toxicities associated with that. So I think this really empowers patients to make choices. We need the tools to communicate that, to describe that to uh, patients, um, but people have options that they can custom tailor to their own needs and preferences.